The sun's up and it's starting to warm up today and we're thankful for that. But more importantly, we're thankful that you've joined us online this morning. That you're here and you're joining us from your home or from even some of you I know can be traveling and bring that up as you travel. Wherever you are this morning, we're thankful you're here. We're thankful you've decided to join us in praise and study of God's Word and communion with our Lord. We have sort of a skeleton crew here putting on our live streaming this morning. It's good to see all of them and have a few uh, with us. But remember that even though we're apart, you are still dear to us. And we're thankful for our time together this morning. So let me encourage you now. Be ready. Open your heart and begin to sing and worship and praise God together with us today. I will call upon the Lord. I will call upon the Lord. Who is worthy to be praised. Who is worthy to be so shall I be saved. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth and blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Jesus Christ, He died for me, Jesus Christ, he died for me. and He took away my sin. Yeah. 
to their first day of school in kindergarten and as the teacher observed them over the course of the day and the weeks she found out that they became instant friends and as these boys grew up together they became inseparable they spent the night at each other's homes they played sports together they dated sisters together they they didn't let anything separate them they were the closest of friends and when one was drafted into the military during wartime the other one signed up to be with his friend. And oftentimes there would be battles and they would get separated, but as they would look for each other after each battle, they would hug and embrace each other when they found each other because they were such close friends. There was one battle in particular where the, the boys got separated. And as they returned back to the, 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 the base, they couldn't find one another. One of them couldn't find the other. And he went to his commander and he said, please let me go out and look for my friend. And he said, no, it's no use. He's probably dead. Uh, in fact, if, if I let you go, then, you know, something may happen to you. But he, plagued, he begged and he pleaded with his friend, with his commander, and his commander finally let him go. Hours passed by and they would hear shots in the dark and shots in the morning and they thought maybe he had been killed. But as the early dawn passed on the next morning, they saw the young man holding his friend, walking through the mist. And tears were streaming down the face of the commander, and he, he looked at the young man and he said, you know, I'm so sorry about your friend. I, I, I could have told you it was useless. And he said, no, sir, it wasn't useless. I found him before he passed. And right before he passed, he said this to me. I knew you'd come. I knew you'd come. You know, no matter how many times we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, no matter how many times we stand at the foot of the cross, we can look into the face of Jesus and say to him, I knew you'd come. I knew you'd come. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friend. Isn't it a wonderful thing to be a friend of Jesus? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your Son, who through his incredible love loved us so much that he laid down his life for us, that we can look at him as we read about him in Scripture and watch how his determination and his passion 
for your will and for us was just so manifested as he went to the cross. Lord, help us to take this bread that represents your son's body that was brutally beaten for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's continue our prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your son to die for us on the cross. As we read about that in the Gospels, we read about how he was beaten and how blood flowed from his body. Lord, we take this cup and remember the, the sacrifice of your son. We do this in his name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, let's go to our Father in prayer this morning. Father, what a joy it is to, uh, to be able to worship 
with you this morning. And Father, we look forward to our time with you on Sundays as it reminds us of your loving kindness that you poured out upon us through your son Jesus. And Father, it reminds us of, of his resurrection and the hope that was given to us that there is eternal life in your kingdom. And Father, it reminds us of the forgiveness that you have gave us on the cross, a forgiveness that cleanses us and, and gives us peace and joy. And Father, we're grateful for the mercy and the grace that was extended to us and, and the love that abounded to us through his sacrifice. It certainly reminds us, Father, of Jesus as our friend who laid down his life for us. Father, these have been troubling times for us, and, and through all of this, we have seen your faithfulness as you have provided us with so much. Uh, you know that many of our number are struggling with COVID, and we continue to ask you to bless them and heal them quickly. And Father, we pray for our health care facilities that are overflowing. And Father, please give those workers wisdom and energy as they deal with so many cases. We thank you for your care and your loving hand on all of us as we walk through this pandemic. And please know that your kindness is seen and felt by all of us. Father, there's many in our number who are struggling with cancer and both young and old. And Father, we again ask for your kindness on them and for comfort and, and for healing that only you can give. We're thankful, Father, for the good days they have and for the remission that you have granted. Some, Father, in our congregation we know have had recent surgeries, and, and we pray for their health, we pray for their healing, we pray for their recovery. And there's some this week that are going to be having procedures and surgeries, and Father, we just pray your, your watchful hand and care over them. Most of all, Father, we're just grateful for the mercy and grace that is always abounding upon us and for us to be able to be a part of your kingdom. And so please give us wisdom as we look for ways to spread the knowledge of your love and your compassion to those that we encounter. We do pray that we can find those who are seeking your love and your forgiveness. We're asking that you grant a, a special love to our missionaries who, who cannot travel to be with family this holiday season and we ask a special kindness on them as they serve you in so many ways. Father, you have blessed us as a congregation, and we're grateful. Uh, just increase our love for each other and give us wisdom on how we can do that. Father, help us make time to listen to you and, and, and time to tune in to your leading. We count it joy, Father, to be able to be a part of your kingdom and, and the love and compassion that it brings. It's in Jesus' name. That we pray. Amen. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid out somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world.
and, and sit by a lazily flowing river on, on a mild summer day underneath a big shady tree. Those are moments that are very enjoyable for me. Their, their moments, those riverside moments, are really sort of a retreat. A, a, a short but important, peaceful, and refreshing retreat. Of being able to get away from the hectic rhythms and the mechanical noises of life. I hope you've had some of those moments, and maybe you don't have as much Huckleberry Finn as what I have in me, but those are really special times, and like I said, I, I hope that you've been able to have some of those riverside moments in your life as well. But when you open the Bible, when you go to the pages of Scripture, you're going to find that not everyone had really good riverside moments. You're going to find that there are times that, that people found, found themselves by the river, and yet it wasn't a time of refreshment for them. It, it wasn't a time of peace for them. Instead, it presented a whole different experience altogether. Let me share with you some of the words of one psalmist as he was experiencing or really reflecting back on a riverside moment. And he said these words, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat and we wept as we remembered Zion. This psalmist is speaking about a time, he's speaking about a time in which the people of God had been carried off into Babylonian captivity. They were experiencing a moment of exile that was going to last many, many years for them. And as they're there by the river of Babylon, as they're there and they're seeing and understanding the situation that they're in, instead of feeling peaceful, instead of feeling refreshed, Actually, they're feeling despair and weariness. And here's why. Because if they stand there by the rivers of Babylon, they realize very clearly that they have lost Zion. Now, that, that may not mean a lot to, to us today. But for them to lose Zion was a big deal. You see, they had, they had lost their homes, that's true, and, and they had lost property, and they had lost their vineyards, and they had lost their culture, and they had lost their freedom. But at this point, as they stand by those rivers, they're mourning, not simply because they lost all of those, but they're mourning because they have lost something even greater than those things. They have lost Zion. They have lost their connection and their relationship with God. You see, for them to lose Zion was to lose everything. Zion meant everything to them. You see, Zion for the Hebrew people was a place where Jesus was. It's the place where when a, a child, a Hebrew child, would come and they would say to their parents, like our kids do today, they'd say, hey, wh where's God? Where does God live? And the Hebrew parent wouldn't do like we do today, wouldn't go, well, he's up there in heaven. But the Hebrew parent would say, listen, let, you see up there, look up there, look up there on that mountain. You, you see that temple? In that temple it is the Holy of Holies. And right there in the Holy of Holies, uh, uh, among all the vessels that are there and, and the Ark of the Covenant, that's where the glory and the presence of God lives. Look, look up there. That's where God is. And as they answered that question, and for that child, and for all the Hebrew people, that presence in the dwelling of God there in Zion meant everything. It meant they were with God, and God was with them. 
But to be in Zion meant even more than that. To be in Zion meant having a relationship with God that provided innumerable blessings. Every blessing, physical and spiritual, that his people enjoyed came right out of his providence there in Zion. To be in Zion meant to be living underneath the protection of God. And there wasn't anything that was going to harm them as long as they were living faithfully in Zion. To live in Zion meant temple worship. It meant for them the place in which they could go and sacrifices for their sins could be given and then they in turn can lift up their own offerings and praise and worship to God. You see, Zion, for those people, meant everything. But now, standing by the rivers of Babylon, those waters only remind them of their disobedience and the fact that they have been cut off from God who makes their lives meaningful and good. Well, it's in this state of affairs that the psalmist, Psalm 137, if you'll look there with me this morning, the psalmist makes his next sad statement. He, he doesn't just say, by the rivers of Babylon we sat and we wept as we remembered Zion. But he, he, he goes one step further here and he says, in the midst of its willows we hung our harps. Psalm 137. In the midst of its willows, in the midst of its trees, as he looks back and he thinks about those times in captivity, it was a moment in which they hung their harps. Poetically speaking, they hung their hearts, hearts in the trees. The psalmist seems to be, in these words, communicating something that is is right at the heart of who these people are. To say we hung our harps in the trees is to talk about and to think about how having lost Zion, they had lost a special place. And that place was the temple again. The temple is where they would ascend to and, and, and they would sing their songs rising up to the temple mount. And, and, and when they got there, they would sing and praise God for all of his rich and marvelous blessings. But it's not just a loss of a place. As they're there in, in Babylon and, and they see they've lost Zion and lost the temple, the place of their worship, they're also seeing and realizing very clearly that they have lost everything. They've lost their blessings. They've lost God's promises and, and provisions in their lives. And so they're, they're not just missing the place, but they're missing everything. And because of that, it's hurt their hearts. They're not just singing because they're not in the right place. But the point is, they don't even have a heart to sing. What's funny, if you look in the text, it says that their captors at moments will command them and, 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 and I think really taunt them and say, Hey! Sing us one of those songs about Zion. Sing us one of those songs about how great and marvelous Zion is. But even as they do that, they can't. They can't sing. All they can do is remember. Remember how they've lost Jerusalem. Remember how they've lost the greatest joy in all of their lives. And as they sense that, as that sets in on them, they seem to have come to this conclusion. We might as well just throw our harps in the trees. Because you see, there will be no singing. There will be no singing here. 
The reason why I'm calling our attention to this psalm this morning is because we are coming to the end of a very troubling year. Even though we haven't been carried off into captivity, and, and maybe you're not really feeling that so much, maybe the quarantines and the isolations, you do feel like you're in a bit of captivity right now. But even though we haven't been carried off into some type of foreign captivity and, and, and experiencing the difficulties that might come with that, we know our own difficulties right now. We are experiencing real difficulties, and as we experience those things, maybe we're like those Hebrew people in Babylon. Maybe we're missing those better days. Maybe we miss those times where, where things were better. And, and here's what I'm afraid might be happening, that as we do, we become so preoccupied with our losses that we lose our zeal for singing and thanking God for His blessings. And, and understand this, when, when I say we lose our zeal for singing, I, I'm really talking about singing, but I'm also talking about anyway, through our prayers and through our praises, in which we have this heart, in which we're just bubbling forth and singing and appreciating all that God has done for us, both spiritually and Physically. I, I'm afraid, like I said, that, that this year may have pulled us down in, into this place in which we don't feel like singing. But let me say this to all of us this morning. Now is not the time to hang our harps in the trees. As a matter of fact, I want us to know and remember that there never, for us as Christians, there's never a moment, there's never a, 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 an experience, there's never a moment in time in which we stop singing. There's never a moment, there's never a, a situation in which we stop expressing and lifting up our praise and our thanksgiving to God for everything that He has done. And the reality of that is this, we never stop singing because we are always in Zion. We now, as the children of God in Christ Jesus, we're always in Zion. And we're always experiencing all the blessings and all the promises and, and all the grace that comes to us as those who live in Zion. Our Zion, our Zion, is, is, you're not going to find it on Google Maps. There's no pinpoint on Google Maps for our Zion. You, it, it, now, you can say to Siri, you can say, Siri, take me to Zion. And, and she might say, Zion National Park, is that where you'd like to go? No. And it might say, how about Zion, Illinois? No. You see, there is no Zion our Zion is not going to be found that way. Our Zion is beyond longitude and latitude. Listen to me. Our Zion that I'm talking about this morning is an ever-present spiritual existence. Listen, it's an ever-present spiritual existence we now enjoy in Christ Jesus. That's our Zion. And the Hebrew writer in Hebrew chapter 12 starts showing to us and encouraging us with this reality of where we actually are as believers in Christ Jesus. Let's read that together, beginning in verse 22. He says, speaking to believers, speaking to these Christians, he says, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to a city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven." You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sp uh, sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. 
It's right here in this passage, and, and it shows up in the Scripture so many different ways, but the Hebrew writer is, is, is clarifying it, sort of bringing together all of these realities about what it means to be in our Zion. And, and I have to admit, I, I know that right here, what we have in this text, we, it's, it's a little Bible-y, Okay. It's, it's a little bit of that Bible talk, and, and, and there's phrases, and there's, and there's statements, and, and nuances that are being expressed that we just really don't talk like that, and we don't always think in those terms. And so, I want to just take a few moments, and, and, and I can't get real deep here, but I, I want to give enough of a picture about what it means for us as Christians to live in Zion in order that it can give us the encouragement and the joy that that we need for our lives today. For you see, our Zion means everything to us as well. When he talks about we have come to Zion, understand when he uses that term come, as he's speaking in the original language, that is in the perfect tense. And what he's saying is we are now and forever will be in Zion. We are now and forever will be with God. Here's his point. We can't be fooled. We can't be fooled by these surroundings. We, we can't be fooled by our bodies. We can't be fooled by what's going on out here in our world. We can't be fooled by all of those experiences because those experiences in these situations don't really tell us where we really are. As Christians, the reality is, is that we are in the very spiritual center and heartbeat of God's presence, where He blesses us and graces us with everything that we need. And, and the Hebrew writer goes on, he says, let me tell you where else you are. You have ascended higher. If you look back as to what the Hebrews writer has been saying here in the opening verses of chapter 12, he's, he's taking us on a journey. And he's telling them, you know, in actuality, you're higher than Mount Sinai. You're beyond Mount Sinai because Mount Sinai was about separation and it was about fear. And then he goes on, he says, you're really even higher than the Mount Zion in Jerusalem because only there were you experiencing imperfect sacrifices for sin. No, you have ascended higher than those mountains and you are now living and dwelling in the heavenly Jerusalem. You are in the heavenly Mount Zion that's far and away above and better than all those other mountains that have been special to you in your experience with God. You see, as we rose from the waters of faith, as we rose as new children of God, as we rose up as new creations in Christ Jesus, Jesus took us and spiritually He lifted us up out of those waters, out of this world, and into the heavenly places. That's why it's Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6 makes so very clear that we have been seated in the heavenly realm. Spiritually speaking, hear this. Spiritually speaking, we are as close to God right now and His blessings as we could possibly be. Regardless of what we might see and experience around us each day. Then he goes on, he says, we are with the church. Jesus has changed us. We've been changed been from being those strangers and those aliens and, and those, those people that were outsiders in, in the kingdom of God. He's changed us and He's turned us into His gathering, His assembly, His church of His firstborn. We are His children now, His blessed children. And, and his, our names have been written in His book, meaning He knows our names. He knows us, and He is intent on blessing us today and tomorrow and even into eternity because we are His children, because we are His church. 
And and in our Zion, we can stand confidently before God the divine judge. This is such an important concept for us. It's something that really continues to bring joy and encouragement in our hearts to know that we can stand before God, the judge of all creation, without fear. That we can stand there without fear of our sin, out, without fear of all of our, uh, our mistakes in life, and we can stand before Him in the confidence of knowing that Jesus Christ and putting our faith in Him has brought us justification by that faith. And not only justification, but in Christ, we have been made the righteous ones of God. I encourage you to look again at Romans chapter 3. Take some time this week and just read through that and absorb and be encouraged by the fact that through Christ we have been justified through faith and we have been made the righteous ones of God. But there's more. In our Zion, we are also standing with thousands and thousands of angels. I missed this in the beginning. I want to go back to this. And, and this is an is a important picture. It, it's not like, and, and maybe you've had this since before, things have changed for us. It's not like we're thinking about the angels, those holy angels of God, and they're up there in heaven, and they get to worship in the presence of God, and then there's us. <laughs> All of us ignoble humans and we're down here on this earthly plane and we're singing our little songs and we're doing our little worship. No, that's not the picture at all. This picture is is that we now are there because God has made us holy in Christ and we've joined the holy host of heaven and we're there and we're singing and we're worshiping and we're celebrating with the same vigor and the same gusto as the angels are because we know who our God is. And finally, we are standing there with Jesus. You see, we live each day as believers in Christ with the Lamb of God. We live with Him, and and He's not just the Lamb who has come and taken away all of our sins. That's, That's wonderful and great and important for us. But He is also the Lamb who through His sacrifice, through His atoning blood, has brought us into an everlasting covenant. That's a promise. That is God, listen, that is God obligating Himself to us. That's God saying, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to care for you, not just today and not just tomorrow, but I'm going to do that forever. You are my covenant people, and nothing can ever separate you from my love. Again, go back to Romans chapter 8 and read again what God's love really is about and how nothing, because we are in covenant with Him, can ever change that love at all. 2020, I think, has had... It's had its disheartening... Riverside moments. It's had those moments when we longed for better days. Maybe you felt that. And I think for some, it's had those moments where we've had to face some unpleasant changes. Changes that I really feel right here this morning. And 2020 has had those moments where it seemed like, I I think it seemed like the good life has just been swept up and it's just being carried down the river away from us. And it's because of these feelings that I think that too often we become preoccupied. We become preoccupied with what's going on in our world. And we forget about where we actually live. My point here is that regardless of all of these moments, these riverside moments that we could be experiencing, now is not the time 
for us to throw our harps in the trees. Now's not the time to stop worshiping and singing praises to our God. Now is the time. Every day is the time. No matter what the situation, no matter what the context is, is it's a time that we should sing. We should sing. And when I say we should sing, I mean we should sing. (laughs) We should make it part of our weeks where we target and we look for those songs that inspire our hearts, those songs that speak to us about God's provision and God's love and His kindness and our faith. And we need to not only just let those songs loop within our minds, that's so good, but we need to let them loose from our lips. We need to be spending some time, even by ourselves and apart from one another, singing about our God and our blessings in Jesus Christ. But we need to also be singing with our attitudes. Now is the time where our attitudes need to be singing forth to the people around us the people at work and the people that we go to school with and the people that we interact with, they need to hear us sing through attitudes of confidence and assurance and peace, knowing that God is going to carry us through this moment. They must, they need, they deserve to see that in each one of us every day that we live and walk among them. And then lastly... We need to sing with our words. It's not just about us all the time, is it? I think it's important for us to be looking at others around us who are worried, who are fearful, who are even distraught. And this is the time that we should be coming alongside of them And we should be telling them, we have an awesome God. We have an awesome God who reigns in heaven above, who reigns over everything in our lives with wisdom, power, and love. We have an awesome God. And don't let these things bring Him down and make Him less than what He actually is. It's a time to sing with our lips and with our attitudes and with our words. I know that we sing. We sing the song oftentimes, we're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. And that's true, we should sing that song, and, and, and the fact is, is that we will one day leave this world behind and go to that heavenly, eternal Zion beyond this world. But let me remind you today, never forget this truth, you are now in Zion. You live in Zion and all of the blessings that God has for you. His care, His assurances, His promises, and His abiding love. And those things, those things are greater than any troubling riverside moment we may ever encounter in our lives. This morning... I hope that you too are living in Zion. That Jesus, through the waters of baptism, through the faith that brings forgiveness to our lives, that He has raised you up and seated you in that heavenly place. He's redeemed you and He loves you and He is giving you all of His promises and hopes for today and tomorrow and forever. If you haven't made your trip to Zion, we want to do what we can to help you do that. You're going to see on the screen here, you can connect with us as can we help you at sunset.cc. Send us an email and let us how we can set you on your way to the heavenly Zion.
today. What better way for us to conclude this morning than to sing? As we conclude, I, I want us, where, I know we're apart, but together let's join our hearts and sing about our Jesus, our precious cornerstone, the foundation of all of our faith and all of our blessings, the one who has led us to Zion itself. Let's sing together as we end today. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe you're all to us. Holy Son of God, Let the righteousness 